Thank you, Brother Dick, and welcome to all those here and to all those watching online. All right. As we begin today, I will not ask you to stand just yet. I'm going to read a passage of scripture from the book of First Timothy, chapter 2. It says, first of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Friends and sisters, we are living in some crazy times. Okay, I know that uh, in a lot of our minds is what's going to happen with our country. Uh, we have um, the attempted assassination of the leading candidate for presidency of the United States. And this is something that is real. This is something that um, should give us the perspective of what does God say about what we should do. The first thing is pray. So we're going to do that right now. Father in heaven, in obeying your scriptures, our supplication right now is that you would be with our country, specifically with our leaders, with the leader of this country, Lord. We pray for President Biden, for his cabinet, for the three branches of government, with every lawmaker in there, with every political candidate during this election season. After what happened yesterday, Lord Jesus, we pray that you would bring political leaders to their knees, especially former President Trump, as he nearly saw death. May all, his, all this chaos be used to bring those in high positions of power to be drawn to you, to be convicted of sin, and for them to realize that if they do not know you, they are a day closer each time to hell and condemnation. So we raise this application in obedience to your scriptures and in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. As far as uh, what should you think, do, again, first of all, pray. Pray. That is where the Christian goes to gain humility, to gain wisdom, and really to be at war with this present wicked world. Secondly, don't be surprised at the depravity of mankind. The scripture is clear about that. With the political temperature being turned up to ultra high levels, don't be surprised that things like this happen. And lastly, in following scripture, be quick to hear and be slow to speak. As Doug Wilson often says, quote, don't bite the bait. That is, don't be, don't be dominated by your emotions. This is a time to exercise wisdom, to see the fruit of, of the spirit in each of our lives, specifically self-control. Remember that ultimately there's no king but Christ. So let us turn to him. Let us remember that as we turn to Christ, we should read his word and we should be doers of the word and pray according to his word. Rest in the fact that God is sovereign and ask yourself, how can I give glory to God in this wicked and evil generation? I will close this brief section with a quote from Samuel Say. He says this, and I quote, May God surround Donald Trump with Christians who pray for him and preach the gospel to him. His life is in the hands of God. If not for the Lord's mercy and grace, he would be summoned for judgment. Pray that he would believe the gospel. And pray the same for Biden. May that be our attitude, my brothers and sisters. For these men are a day closer to judgment, for they do not know the Lord. Now, let us go ahead and stand for the reading of God's word to continue our series in 1 Corinthians. We are in chapter 4, verses 14 through 17. 1 Corinthians 4, 
14 through 17. The word of God, infallible, without error, and with absolute authority, reads as follows. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, by, be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach them everywhere in every church. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word this morning. And thank you that it is your kindness that draws us to repentance. So that by grace through faith in Jesus, we may be forgiven. May your Holy Spirit then give us conviction this morning and understanding. So that we may look to Christ as our perfect example. But also to know who our godly leaders are in our lives, that we may relate to them and follow their examples. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. I titled today's sermon, Accepting Instruction, Imitating Godliness. We are approaching a section of first, the first letter to the Corinthians in which Paul is wrapping up his first major idea. His first major idea was telling the church of Corinth, brethren, knock it off. You are causing worthy divisions. You are raising your godly wisdom. I mean, your worldly wisdom above the wisdom of God. Repent of that. And in this passage, Paul is ensuring to communicate to his audience, that is the Corinthians, that he has a heart of a loving father towards them. The reason this is important is because there is a way in which spiritual leaders can lead by lording over those under them, which many times leads to intimidation and ultimately spiritual abuse. That is not the intent of the apostle here. Paul is rather addressing the church and it makes clear here that his heart is the heart of a loving father. We see this in 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 11 and 12. Although this is not to the Corinthians, we can see the heart of Paul here as a loving father. He says this, For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So Paul is a godly figure, a father figure to them. This to us applies both spiritually and physically. That fathers should be godly fathers and they should exhort their children. This is with the intent to point them to Jesus and never with the aim of being self-righteous in the correction that is being given. We are also told in the scriptures the attitude that should be with those receiving instruction, receiving correction. There's many passages on that, but I think Proverbs 4 verses 1 and 2 give us a snippet of what that is like. It says this, and this is again, this language from a father to a son. It says this, hear, O sons, a father's instruction, and be attentive that you may gain insight. For I give you good precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. So then when a godly father gives instruction, as scripture tells him to do, we should listen. That we may align ourselves with wisdom. And to be clear, what is the issue in receiving instruction that is godly and right? The issue is this, my brothers and sisters. It's us. Naturally, we are bent towards not receiving godly instruction. That's the way we are wired. So it is a constant effort for us to seek, recognize, and hear godly instruction, especially when it's being given from the perspective of a godly 
fatherly figure as Paul was doing to the Corinthians. So then today we will look at three main aspects of what this looks like to accept godly instruction and to imitate godliness. I will give you the three headers up front. First, we're going to see what the intent of godly correction is and should be. Secondly, we're going to see that we should recognize and then imitate godly examples. And thirdly, we're going to see the importance of being consistent with what we preach, with how we live. Consistent Christian living and witness. Let us dig right in. The first header, the intent of godly correction. For that, we'll go to verse 14 of our main text today. It says this. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. So Paul has called the Corinthian church to repentance in matters of pride, spiritual immaturity, being wise in their own merits and in their own minds. And he has pointed them instead to turn to God. God has led Paul to plant this church, and it is now a divided church. This is the first issue that Paul has addressed. There's other issues, but we'll get to them soon enough in chapter 5. But here in verse 14, we see clearly, clearly that Paul has now pointed out the sin of the Corinthian church in order to humiliate them. That is not his intent. Paul is not being self-righteous in bringing these things up to the Corinthian church. Rather, Paul says that he's doing this as a godly father figure who is instructing his beloved children. That's the wording in the verse there. That is, he's given an admonition to be taken as a warning, as a rebuke. That is showing love. So then godly correction is not intended to humiliate the recipient. Paul has called them out on these things because he cares for them and he loves them. If you have a brother and sister in the Lord that sees that you are obviously in the wrong, that you are obviously headed the wrong path, and they don't tell you anything, they are not being polite. They are lacking love towards you. So then how, how does godly admonition and correction look like? First, godly correction is done in love. Let us look at Ephesians 4.15. It says this. This is, again, the author is Paul here. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. Also, Proverbs 27, 5 and 6. It says, better is open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. How else should godly correction be given? Well, it is to be done in gentleness, yet with boldness. Again, the writings of Paul, Galatians 6.1 says this, Brothers, if anyone is, called, is caught in any transgression, you who, have, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watching yourself, lest you to be tempted. In gentleness, and then with firmness, with boldness. Ephesians 6.19, again, Paul's the author says this, and also for me, he's asking people to pray for him, and it says that to pray for him, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. So in gentleness, but not watering things down with boldness. Lastly, godly correction, another aspect we could see of it in the scriptures is that it is to be done in righteousness, with the standard being the scriptures. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, we should know these scriptures by heart. It says this, how much of the scripture? All the scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the men of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So when, when we correct people, when we admonish people, when Paul is giving these corrections to the Corinthian church, What's the base for him doing that? What is he pointing to as a standard? The scriptures. And so should be with us. When we are admonishing someone or even looking into our own life into what we should correct, the standard we should use to do that is none other than the scriptures. 
Header number two. In order to accept instruction and imitate godliness, we have to be able to recognize godly leaders and then imitate their example. We'll go to verses 15 and 16 of our main text today. It says this, for though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became a father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. Paul is making it clear. He has a leadership role in the Corinthian church. He has, therefore, a big responsibility for their well-being. Recognizing a godly example, then, in Paul's case, he is putting himself as a fatherly figure to the church. And that is extremely important. What is the method, then, of recognizing and deciding whether someone is a godly example that you should follow? It should always be rooted in the gospel. Paul tells the Corinthians in this very verse, verse 15, that he is their spiritual father because of Christ Jesus through the gospel. That is the means by which he is their spiritual father. This is important because this applies to us today. There are many countless gurus out there that seem to offer us advice that many times, in fact, may seem clever advice and helpful. This would include life coaches, motivational speakers, social media influencers, and even our own close friends and family. Now, would the advice of all these characters be wrong necessarily? No, not necessarily. But when you are receiving instruction and admonition about the most important things in life and issues of life and death, and you're getting that from someone who does not have a regenerate mind, from someone who does not regard the scriptures, it's only a matter of time before you will be led astray. Paul then also tells them that while there may, they may have several guides or several tutors, as other translation says that word, they do not have many fathers. Paul is their spiritual father in the sense that he took the gospel to them and planted the church at Corinth. The key here is that it is not presumptuous for a godly leader to be given his right spot. Paul is not elevating himself, claiming that he's much better than them. He's not doing that. But he's rightly claiming the spot that belongs to him. He is their spiritual father. This said, let us remember that while we are to look to spiritual godly leaders for good example and so we can imitate them, the test is twofold. First, is their theology biblical? And do they live out their theology? Right? And if they meet those two criteria, by and large, that's a good indication. But let us be reminded that even Godly spiritual fathers, godly spiritual leaders of the Christian faith, they are not infallible. They are still sinful men. Paul himself tells us so about himself. In 1 Timothy 1.15, he says this, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Paul is accepting there that he is a sinner. Romans 7, 21 and 24, this is a good passage in which Paul again confesses. It says, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And then if you keep reading that passage, he says, only Jesus. So then nevertheless, Paul, being a sinner, knowing that he's a sinner, he was nevertheless a godly spiritual father. He knew his shortcomings, and he was not hypocritical about it. He humbly accepted his faults, but he was still be able to be an obedient ambassador for Christ and a father to those at the church of Corinth. And therefore he can tell them 
imitate me. Now the application for us, more direct, starting with me, this is talking about spiritual leaders. As a pastor, I need to be aware of the fact that I am a sinner saved by grace. And yet, I also need to be kept to account that God expects me to be able to say to you, imitate me as I imitate Jesus. That is the standard. The idea is there has to be tangible, visible fruit of me as a spiritual leader so that when I give you an exhortation, I am not telling you something that I myself am not doing. That is a high calling. And then, what about you as the recipients? You should be able to receive that instruction, that exhortation. But then, what about you towards others? Well, guess what? That same standard applies to you. God also expects you to follow godly conduct and to likewise be able to exhort others and be able to tell them to imitate you. If you're a Christian, you have that expectation. The question then becomes, can you do that today? Can you tell others to imitate you as you imitate Christ? That is the goal for the Christian to be able to claim that. Leads to the next and last point. In order for us to be worthy of imitating, we need to have a consistent Christian living by the witness that we give. A living out what we learn and what we proclaim. Therefore, we should be able to know who our spiritual leaders and fathers are in the faith. Again, the standard should be their theology is solid and they have a life that shows that they practice what they preach. But also, we should be able to be spiritual examples ourselves to others. So then, are you a spiritual example for others? The answer is actually yes. Whether you've been a bad example or a good example, you are a spiritual example to others. On a daily basis, those that are around you, those that watch how you behave, how you speak, how you react, how you conduct yourself, you are being an influence on them. You are giving them a witness of who you really are. Further, it is important to note that the correction Paul has given the Corinthians is consistent with what Paul has taught and showed Timothy by word and by deed. And then that same teaching is also consistent with what Paul has taught at every other church. Hence, Paul is consistent, he is biblical, he is worthy of being imitated because of his word and because of his deed. He lives out what he preaches. The question for us is, how consistent are we with what we claim to believe versus with how we actually live? Did you know, I've looked at multiple surveys over the years when they interview people who are anti-Christian or when they interview children that grew up in the church and that went apostate. You know what the number one complaint is of those two groups? The ones who hate Christians and the ones who was raised in the church and went apostate. You can guess it, right? Is this. My parents would teach me one thing, but showed me the opposite by the way they lived. My brothers and sisters, we don't need to look outside to the wickedness going on. 
that is going to corrupt our children if you are giving a bad example to your children. Your children are not dumb. They're watching you every day. They remember how you treated them. They remember how you treated their mother. They remember how you treated their father, how you reacted, how you yelled and screamed and disrespected your husband. Kids remember that. And when that consistently doesn't match what you are preaching, you will lose your children. You are being a horrible parent. That's the truth. My brothers and sisters, may that never be. May that never be. For we are to give a consistent witness in our living of what we say we believe. And not be the opposite of what we're teaching our kids. Those are your first disciples. And if you say, well, I don't have an influence over you, you do. You just have a bad influence over me. All right, so final thoughts, reflections on today's passage. I have three. Biblical application for everyday living. Number one, the gospel must be at the root of every correction, if it's to be godly correction. Therefore, if our goal is to point to others their faults, to shame them, to humiliate them, we are not doing that in a godly manner. We are not to be offensive jerks for the sake of doing that, no. Because remember this, godly correction is rooted in the gospel. And the gospel is offensive enough already. Okay? The gospel tells people God is holy and you are a sinner. If you want to reconcile with God, you must repent of your sin. Walk away from your wickedness. Turn to Jesus. Trust in his perfect life, in his death, in his burial, and in his resurrection by faith. If you trust in that, the righteousness, the goodness that you need to be made right with God will be given to you. That is the only way. That message is offensive to people because this message tells people that you are not a good person. I don't care what, how many good deeds you've done. You are a sinner on the way to hell if you have not put your faith in Christ and in him alone. That message is offensive enough. Now, let us share that message when we exhort, when we correct, when we admonish a brother or sister or even an unbeliever so that they may turn to Jesus because that's the only way that someone will turn to Jesus by hearing the gospel. That's where it all should be rooted. Secondly, beware of watered down instruction or correction. We don't do that here. Paul did not waver in calling out the sins of the Corinthians. His intent was to restore them to obedience and to humility before God. Now notice, Paul didn't mince words when mentioning the ways in which they had sinned. And we haven't seen all of it yet. We're barely in chapter 4. So then the application for us is this. When correcting others, we must not do it to humiliate them. We must not do it in self-righteousness, but also we must not water it down. We might not just use the mantra of, oh, you know what, brother, sister, don't worry. Like God loves you and he has sufficient grace for you. Well, that could be taken in context to be accurate. If you keep rebelling against God over and over and over and over, you will prove yourself to be an apostate or an unbeliever, which in the case is the same. We must not water down our exhortations that are done humbly and with a purpose to be rooted in the gospel so that we can turn to Christ. The need for repentance needs to be mentioned in our corrections and our exhortations. Lastly, just piggybacking on what we already discussed. If others imitate you, would they be imitating Jesus? That's a question for you today. For us parents, again, inevitably, our character, our actions, our speech, our behavior will be imitated by our children. Take that to the bank. 
the warning here then is you will negate the discipleship of your children if you constantly fail to practice what you teach them. And to all the children here, if you can hear me, listen up. When your parents give you godly instruction, listen to them. This is a command, as the scripture says, that is given with a promise that you will do well if you listen to your parents, because that is good. That's what the scripture says. So then God expects every Christian to be able to say what Paul says. Specifically in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Now, when we evaluate ourselves against that standard, the truth is obvious. We have failed to do so. Okay? We have failed. But the gospel doesn't call us to remain in despair or in a state of, okay, well, everything's lost. Then it's done. Game over. No. There is good news. That is the gospel. And is this, that while all of us have fallen short of being like Jesus, because of God's grace, we can be saved and we can be sanctified. That is, becoming more and more like Jesus every day. So that we can say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. God will provide the endurance, the perseverance, the faith that we need so that we can repent and be more like Jesus every day. Because the reality is that we are not let off the hook. God expects us to obey because he has given us his Holy Spirit to be able to do so. When we rebel against that is because we prefer our wickedness rather than being turned to Jesus to be forgiven by him. May God's Holy Spirit then allow us to do this according to his will. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have come down to be our perfect example. You are the one who has convicted us of our sin by the power of your Holy Spirit so that we would repent and turn from our, from our sin. Father in heaven, we thank you then that you have been so kind to us. In so many instances, you have corrected us in love time and time again. So there, therefore, we ask that you grant us to turn to you in repentance so that we may not become hardened and callous to your correction. Help us to be consistent in our life and in our witness to our children, to our families, to our church, and to the world. That this may be done for our good and for the glory of Christ. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus.